Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings be upon you all. Shalom, ashe. Peace. It's, it's a phenomenal honor, and, uh, and I'm, I'm just phenomenally just blessed to be here and very, I admit, somewhat intimidated <laughs> <laughs> being in the presence of such uh, inspirational and legendary people. Um, this is, in fact, you know, uh, the only second time I've been in Louisville, the, the last, first, and only time before this was perhaps one of the most inspirational uh, moments in my life, particularly as my life as an American Muslim in North America. And that, as many of you can imagine, was none other than less than a year ago for the funeral and memorial of Muhammad Ali. Um, a couple stories came to mind about that moment that I, I felt would be relevant to share. Um, there, after, as you may remember, there was the prayer, and then the next day there was a memorial. And so there were just Muslims, literally, it was the <laughs> Louisville became Mecca of North America. <laughs> I think you uh, folks here did not know uh, what hit you, but literally Muslims from every walk of life background converge on Louisville. And we were walking around the streets and, you know, there was that one moment as we were coming to the, walking to the center and I was with it and it was a, it was a, a, a dynamic assembly of us. It was around 15, 20. We had one of the former boxers with us, so intimidating brother. We had uh, African-American, <laughs> Latinos, uh, all Muslim, different backgrounds, hijabs of different colors, sisters with no hijabs. And we were walking and it was almost a procession. And at one point, as we were walking, there was a sister across the street at a bus stop. And we heard her shouting something from a distance at us. As we got closer, we started making out what she was saying. Salam alaikum! Salam alaikum! Salam alaikum! And, and, and we started looking at each other. <laughs> What's going on? But then it almost magically, at the same moment, there was a smile that emerged on all of our faces at the profound realization that this woman wasn't out of her mind. <laughs> that in fact, this woman who had stepped outside of the bus stop absorbed in the loss of one of the most beloved human beings on the face of the planet right from who emerged from Louisville right here, extending every ounce of love and compassion she could to a group of Muslims that were coming from all over the world. And she did it in her best attempt to give us an assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Now, now, the rest of the day was like that, and I'm not exaggerating. I, I, you know, there was at one point we went to a little ice cream spot here later in the day, and I was with a group of sisters. I went to get out my pocket, and there was a brother with a young uh, boy who literally put his hand across me. Nah, I got this, bro. <laughs> the love that we felt, mm. and you must appreciate the discourse that was already in the air about Americans and Muslims mm. Mm. coming out of Louisville because of one human being who had inspired others to transcend anything that have to do with geography, race, ethnic background, to show compassion. Mm. Mm. Now, we think about that ability, which all of our faith traditions tell us is really at the fundamental core of what it means to be a human being, to be able to show compassion. So, but we must, as faith communities, and I believe this as an organizer, not be sentimental in, or Pollyannish in acknowledging then what has happened in our localities to prevent us, to deny us from expressing compassion. What has allowed us to segregate our ability to who we show compassion and what gives us the righteous doctrines 
that we have internalized as righteous and, and religious in some cases, social and spiritual, to somehow rationalize those moves. And you can't in America not talk about that alongside the broader flow of segregation. Now, I think about that in the context of a person who organizes and works and lives on the south side of Chicago, have done so for the last 20 years. And I think about the legacy. I live right in front of a park that Martin Luther King came to over 50 years ago. To use righteous indignation to demonstrate that compassion in action must surface the real issues. That real compassion doesn't gloss over the evils of the day. It challenges us to wrestle with them. When King marshaled 700 freedom marchers on August 5th, 1966 into a southwest working class white neighborhood with only a few other folks in there, including my mother, one of the only non-white and first Palestinian refugees in Marquette Park, he encountered over 5,000 people Children, grandmothers, rocks, signs, go home were perhaps the most kindest thing that was said that day. Bottles thrown, feces thrown. But when asked by the media, did he regret coming to Marquette Park after he said, in fact, and this is a year after Selma, said it, he, he had never encountered more hatred and hostility anywhere in the South. But he said, not an ounce of regret. We had to bring the evil out into the light of day. That type of righteous indignation is compassion in action. It's living compassion. It's challenging us, not as those people over there, but as one human family to come to terms with the artificial divisions and barriers, the false hierarchy of human value, i.e. white supremacy that we have superimposed on all of our structures, and to work at the messy intersections. Faith communities, we shouldn't be looking for just the clean, sanctimonious corners in the churches and the mosques and the temples and the synagogues, but King and others and Martin Luther and, and Malcolm and, and Chavez and all of the greats challenged us to come to the messy intersections, to get a little dirty. In Chicago, we've worked at the intersections of Arab corner stores and low-income black communities to confront uh, uh, Arab communities to come to terms and reckoning what types of uh, evils they've inherited and perpetuated and how to transform. It's one thing to challenge oppression there's a prophetic tradition that says, help your brother if he's an oppressor or oppressed. They asked the prophet Muhammad, we get the oppressed, but how do we help the oppressor? Stop him from oppressing. Mm. And how do we do that? I believe one way is to get into the muck, to get into the mess. Mm. Pastor Cosby, you profoundly floored us last year with your talk. One thing you talked about is this little race you all got coming up here in a couple of weeks, the rules. Now, I'm not a betting man, but I'll never forget the rules you laid out that you have to bet on the horse while it's in the mud. Not when it's in the winter circle, but in the mud. Mud is a profound metaphor, I think, for us to think about. In our tradition, we think about this notion that kulukum min adam wa adam min turab, mud is a humbler, that all of you are from Adam and Adam is from the dirt, from the mud. Remember that. From it you come, to it you return. And every five times a day, Muslims prostrate to God, putting our heads to the mud, to the dirt, to remind ourselves we ain't all that. Come on, man. We're not better this notion than another human being. We all come from this and we'll return to this in your PhDs and MAs and accolades <laughs> and bank portfolios. Don't change that fact. Yeah. <laughs> but there's another, there's another thing about mud. Mud is malleable. Mud can be inspirational. We can refashion, reimagine, radically recast ourselves in that mud. And I believe that 
we as faith communities shouldn't just run to the comfortable conversations about joint, you know, notions of my scripture and your fist. Let's run together to the mud. Let's refashion, reimagine the possibilities of a greater country, a greater city, and a greater world. Thank you so much. <laughs> Spectacular. <laughs> what gives you hope? You know, uh, every week uh, on one of the largest subsets of the population that I work with are the returning citizens and formerly incarcerated uh, as well. And every week, Saturday mornings, we get together after prayer. There's around 25 of us that go out to breakfast. And I'm talking about an accumulation of perhaps with no exaggeration, 700, 800, 900 years of prison time. Mm. Many of those years spent in total isolation, 23 <laughs> hours of the 24 hour day in complete isolation. But I have met human beings that have utterly humbled me, that have mentored me, that have taught me uh, the real purpose of life and uh, I get tremendous inspiration from wow, them. Wow. Um, I remember one, human, one, one brother who actually was um, beaten into a confession during the Burge years, uh, a, a superintendent, a, a, a commander who was notorious for police brutality in Chicago, not something that just started with the brutal, brutal murder of Laquan McDonald a couple years back. Certainly King also 50 years ago challenged Chicago to confront that legacy and it's existed. Um, and this brother actually ended up serving close to 17 years before he was exonerated. And many of those years were in, again, solitary confinement. Now, when he came out, I'm not joking, Pastor, he had light on his face and it, you know, it was a big case. Uh, and people were around him as he was mobilizing and organizing with us. And I was just watching him from the side because I was just waiting for that moment. How does a person survive and come out looking like this? And I asked them that directly after two weeks. He said two words. Now he had become a Muslim, but he talked about this and it taught me something about faith. I said, what are those two words? In Arabic he said, Surah Yusuf. In English that is the story of Joseph. Mm -hmm. And it taught me that he's not a scholar in religious tradition by any means, but the human beings that have really internalized the highest values in all our faith traditions, that have been the most transformative, have gone through such uh, harrowing experiences and have come out. We've passed legislation on parole reform. The last year, a, a piece of legislation that passed in the state of Illinois on parole reform was written by a brother with us who was himself on death row. Wow. And those are the things that inspire me because I feel, you know, when you're in the face of that and you're in the presence of that, you don't have time to not just stop moving forward. Oh, mm -hmm. that's powerful. Yeah. Other questions, comments, thoughts? What's the noise? Well, <laughs> I'm, it's thunder over Louisville this weekend. Yeah. And I'm going to assume it's the F-16s practicing. Thank you. Kind of a jarring. Uh, Juxtaposition, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the mother in me needed to know. <laughs> I think there were some others in the audience who needed to know too. <laughs> I heard the stirring. Um, No, that wasn't it. Wasn't that it. wasn't it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a much gentler sound than what we were hearing up here.